we're going to be working through this introduction to Neon Soul Sensor Data Products or Data Tutorial. And I put the link to that tutorial in the chat uh, there so you can um, pull that up. We're, I'm going to be live coding during this. And let me share my screen so you can see that. So hopefully, hopefully you're seeing my R Studio window here and uh, can see that. And this is the data tutorial, um, that link that I put in the chat uh, that we're going to be working through today. There are two ways you can follow along during this data tutorial. You can even just, uh, just copy the code as I type it into R and copy that in on your end to work through it. Or if you prefer, you can scroll all the way down to the bottom of the data tutorial and you can get, you can download the uh, lesson code. And so there's this R file down here, soil temperature, moisture, and CO2 uh, dot R uh, that contains all the codes that we're gonna run through today in the tutorial. So with that, let's kind of get started. And today the, the format is gonna be that we are gonna take a look at some soil CO2 concentration data and look at controls on that soil CO2 concentration data in the context of soil moisture and also soil temperature. So do soil temperature and soil moisture seem to be influencing soil CO2 concentrations at one of our NEON sites. We're gonna be downloading quite a lot of data. So we're downloading the soil temperature data product, the soil water content data product, and the soil CO2 concentration data product. And we're gonna be downloading a full year's worth of data. So it is quite a lot of data. And so I'm gonna have us jump right in and begin with that data download. And then while that download is running, which will probably take a few minutes, depending on everyone's internet connection, um, I'm gonna show a few slides about how the data is collected in the field and also where you can find some more information about those data products. And then we'll come back to the tutorial again and start working with that data. So uh, the very first thing, which hopefully a lot of you have already done, but if you haven't, you need to install the Neon Utilities R package. So if you haven't done that already, you could do that just by typing in install.packages and then Neon Utilities. Whoops. Um, I've already installed Neon Utilities, so I'm not gonna run this, uh, but if you haven't done it, please do that uh, so that you can follow through with the rest of the data tutorial. But one thing that we will all need to do is load the Neon Utilities package into our environment. So I'm gonna write library and then Neon Utilities and run that line so that we can work with the functions that are contained within it. And we're going to start off, as I said, downloading some data. Let's start off by downloading the soil temperature data. And so I'm going to put that into something called ST for soil temperature. We're going to make use of the load by product function that's contained within Neon Utilities. So right, load by product. It comes up with a little prompt here, so I'm just going to hit enter on that. And then if we click in the parentheses there and hit the tab button, it comes up with a lot of the, well, all the options that we can specify in here. Um, the first thing that we wanna specify is the DP ID or data product ID. So that's the um, identifier that Neon assigns to the, all of our data products. And for soil temperature, I can tell you what it is and I'll show you in a minute where you can find that information. So you wanna do quotation marks and then uppercase, DP, the data product, 1.00041.001. And that's the identifier for the neon soil temperature data product. The next thing that we want to specify is so if we put a comma in, hit tab again, we could pull up the, the list again. The next thing we're going to specify is the site. Today, we're gonna to be working with data from the Santa Rita Experimental Range in Arizona, which has a NEON site code of uppercase S-R-E-R. -E After that, we're gonna specify the start date for the time period that we wanna download. And we're gonna download the, all the data from 2021. So I'm gonna write, we've got start date 
equals, and then in quotation marks, 2021-01 for January 2021. And then we're gonna put in the end date to be 2021-12, so December 2021. This is gonna be quite a lot of data once we add all the three data products together, it's gonna to be around 200 megabytes. So if you're concerned about the amount of data, if your internet connection might be a little bit slow, uh, if you prefer, you can reduce to a smaller time frame. So perhaps change, instead of starting in January, you could change that to 01 to 06 and start in June and just go through to August. So change the 12 to 08. Um, but otherwise you can continue uh, you'd be able to continue with the rest of this tutorial. You'll just be working with a smaller data set. Um, but otherwise, if you've got a, a reasonable data collection connection, um, we can download this full year worth of data. Uh, the next thing I'm going to specify is the package. There are two package types. We just can use the basic package. There is also an expanded package that includes usually just additional information about our data quality metrics, but we don't need that for our tutorial. So we can get by with the simpler, smaller basic package. And then we're gonna specify the time index. Uh, this, these soil data products that we're working with come as both 30 minute averages and also one minute averages. We're gonna work with the 30 minute data just because it's smaller than the one minute data. And the last thing, that we need to specify is this check size, uh, check dot size equals, and I'm gonna set that to F for false. So basically saying, uh, we don't wanna ch check the size or the amount of data that we're gonna download before we download it. If we didn't specify that at all, or if we put a T or true here, then before we downloaded the data, uh, this load by product function would give us an estimate of how much data we were downloading and ask us if we wanted to continue with that. Um, but once you've worked with the data a little bit, it's kind of easier to have it set to false. Uh, so you're not always getting asked for that. So now I'm going to run this line and it's beginning the data download. So you can see that happening down here at the bottom of my screen. It's identified these 471 files and it's beginning to download more. While that's happening, let's just copy this whole line and we're just going to modify it slightly to download our soil water content data. So I just pasted it below. We're just going to change two things. So I'm going to change the ST to something called SWC for soil water content. And then we're going to change the data product ID instead of being 00041, which is soil temperature, we want to change it to 00094, which is soil water content. And again, I'm going to show you in a minute where you can find those data product IDs. Now we can run that line. Uh, and the rest of the information all stays the same. We still want to download it from Santa Rita Experimental Range and for the year of 2021. I'm going to copy it one more time, and we're going to replace uh, the SWC with CO2. This is where we're going to put our so soil CO2 concentration data. And that has a data product ID of 0009. Five. And then we can download all of that data. So while that is downloading, I just want to share a couple of slides about how this data is collected in the field. So I'm going to share these slides here. So this is just the sort of standard NEON map that you've maybe seen if you looked at the NEON website showing the location of all of our NEON sites, uh, 81 monitoring sites dotted around the US. Uh, 47 terrestrial sites, 34 aquatic sites. Uh, the soil data products that we're working with today are only collected at the terrestrial sites. And we're working with the data from the Santa Rita Experimental Range, which is this site that I've circled in red uh, down at the bottom left here. So zooming in to what a, a terrestrial site would look like, or at least the sensor component of a terrestrial site, uh, all of the sites would have the same basic layout. Of course, there are slight differences in the ecosystems, um, but they're going to have the same sort of neon infrastructure in all of them. So over on the left here, we've got our instrumented tower where we make a range of meteorological measurements, as well as the eddy covariance measurements and some other measurements as well. 
Below that, we've got our instrument hut, where we collect all the data from the site before sending it to the NEON headquarters for processing. In the bottom left down here, we've got our precipitation gauge surrounded by some wind shielding. And then all of the terrestrial sites include five sensor-based soil plots, and they're usually arranged in a transect radiating out from the tower as shown here. So this is the Central Plains Experimental Range Site in Colorado, uh, but any of the other sites would look broadly uh, similar to this. These soil plots are spaced between 25 and 40 meters apart based on an assessment of the spatial variability of soil temperature and moisture that we conducted during the site establishment phase. And they're usually positioned in the upwind or the predominantly upwind direction from the tower to maximize connectivity with the tower base measurements and also in the locally dominant soil type immediately surrounding the tower. So zooming into an individual soil plot, um, that would look something like this. And this is one of our soil plots out at the Lenoir landing site in Alabama. Uh, but again, all of these soil plots would look, broadly speaking, uh, the same, uh, of course, with different uh, vegetation and background. Um, now this soil plot happens to contain every single possible sensor that could be deployed in a neon soil plot, but not all of the soil plots will include all of these different sensors. However, all five soil plots at each terrestrial site will include a soil temperature profile. And you can see the top of that here. They also include a soil moisture profile and the top of that shown right here. And then a soil CO2 concentration profile, which is made up of these three larger white PVC tubes here. That it's sort of hard to see on this picture, but they're buried at slightly different depths. So they're making measurements of slightly different depths in the soil to build up that soil CO2 concentration profile. And all of these measurements are within a few meters of each other. Uh, for soil temperature, we have up to nine measurement levels down to two meters deep, assuming we could get that deep in the soil. Uh, for soil moisture, we have eight measurement levels down to two meters deep. And then for soil CO2 concentrations, we have the three measurement levels. And those are concentrated near the soil surface. So they're usually not deeper than about 20 centimeters deep for the deepest one. And then all of the other sensors that are shown here are only present in a subset of the soil plots, and in some cases only in a subset of the sites. Um, so that's kind of the setup in the field. I wanted to also show you where you could find some more information about the data products themselves. I'm just going to pull up my browser here, and we are going to navigate to the NEON uh, homepage. So neon science.org. And if I hover over this data and samples tab here and click on the arrow underneath it, it brings up this menu. I'm going to click the arrow that is next to data portal, bringing up another menu. And then if we click on explore data products, this is where we can find more information about all of the NEON data products. And there's a search bar over here on the side. Oh, we've already got soil temperature typed into mine. So it's going to be bringing up data products that are related to soil and temperature. Um, and if we scroll down here, we're starting to see some of these data products uh, linked here. And the third one down is our soil temperature data products. And here you can see it's data products ID right underneath where it says soil temperature. And if we click on this link, this is the web page that is going to describe the soil temperature data product. Again, we've got its data product ID prominently displayed, so you can find that. Uh, we've got some like basic information summarizing how the data is being collected, information about how you can cite the data if you end up using it in a paper or something. Um, some more information about how that data is collected. We've got this documentation section, which is really in-depth. Um, probably not the best place to start unless you really want to dive into all of the details because it can be almost overwhelming to look at it. But one of the documents that can be good to take a look at is this quick start guide, which should be available for all of the NEON data products. Um, and you can download that here, or if you just scroll down a tiny bit further, it's actually displayed in the document viewer. And this is the quick start guide is a really short document that just gives you a quick summary of the data product and some common uh, ways that you might want to manipulate that data to do the types of uh, analyses that are commonly undertaken with it. And so that can be a document to take a, a look at when you're first starting to work with a new 
Neon data for that. Going down a little bit further, you've got the issue log. So listing any issues that are affecting the data pro or the, this data product, either ongoing issues, which are these highlighted ones, or um, already resolved issues, which are also included further down in the table. Then we've got our availability table. Oh, and I guess up here, I'll just point out, you can also manually download the data, although we won't be using that feature today. We're going to be doing it all programmatically in R. And then right at the bottom, there's this visualization section that you can also use. So that's one way you can navigate to these pages. I actually find it easier nowadays to just do a, a web search. So just write in like neon and then swivel water content or something like that, the name of the neon data product. And almost always the top link that comes up is the data product web page. So I usually navigate to the web pages like that nowadays. And this web page is going to be laid out almost exactly the same as the uh, soil temperature example that I just showed. So I won't go through it. But one thing I did want to point out here is just in the second paragraph here, we've got this sentence here that tells us that the measurement depths are not currently being reported correctly in the sensor positions file in the soil water content and water salinity data product. Uh, and so that's important for what we're going to be doing today because we're going to be using the soil water content data products and we want to know the measurement depths of the sensor that we're going to be using. So it goes on to tell us that there is a workaround with this uh, SWC underscore depths V2 CSV file that has been added uh, where we can download and get the correct installation depths. So I'm just going to scroll down on this page and download that file so that we can use it in a, in a few minutes when we get to that stage. So going down to this documentation section, I've got, I can find this file here, swc underscore depths v2. I'm just going to click the download button and pull that up, pull that up right now. Uh, and I'll open it up and uh, we'll have that available for when we need it. Uh, but right now, let me go back to my R Studio. window. Okay, so hopefully everybody's data has finished downloading. Mine has. Uh, hopefully that's the case for you. Let's start working with our soil temperature data. I'm going to plot a time series of the soil temperature data that we have just downloaded. But as I mentioned, there are uh, a lot of soil temperature sensors at each site. So each of the five soil plots at the Santa Rita Experimental Range site is going to have a soil temperature profile consisting of up to nine measurement depths. So we don't want to plot all of that data. Uh, that'd be too much to look at just quickly. We're just going to pick one sensor. And so we're going to work with data from soil plot one and from measurement level two, which is the sensor that has a nominal depth of approximately six centimeters. And I'll show in a minute where you can find the exact measurement depth. Before we do that, let's get a feel for what we're actually working with. So I'm going to use the head function. So just write head, parentheses, and then we're going to write type in ST, where we put our soil temperature data, and then dollar sign, and then our studio is bringing up the five tables that are present within it. We're just going to use two of these tables today. So we're going to use the sensor positions table, and we're also going to use this one called ST underscore 30 underscore minute. Uh, that's our time series data. So let's take a quick look at that. So, so we're going to uh, print the first few lines of this uh, data table. And that's what's showing up down here. So if we look in here, we've got a column. This is the first six lines. And then, you know, it's just showing the next columns down here. But the first column is the domain ID. Uh, we just downloaded data from one site. It's in domain 14 or D14. The site ID is, of course, SRER, which must be specified. And then we've got the horizontal position here. These ones are all 001, indicating soil plot one, and that should uh, range up to 005 for soil plot five. Next, we have the vertical position. Um, these are all 501, which is indicating our shallowest measurement level. Uh, so by convention, the neon uh, vertical indices that are measured below the soil surface start with a five, whereas if they're above the soil surface, um, then they would start with a zero. So 501 is our shallowest 
vertical position, and that would increase down to 509, which would be our deepest uh, soil temperature sensor. Uh, we've got the start date time for our averaging interval, so starting on the, the 1st of January. And then we've got the end date time for our averaging interval. So you can see it's 30 minutes later. Then the column that we probably most care about is the soil temp mean, so the mean soil temperature within that 30 minute interval. Then there's some additional columns here that I'm not really going to go into, but summarize data collected during that averaging interval. But the other column that we are going to be using is this final QF column. So final QF, that stands for final quality flag. And all of the NEON data products, or at least all the sensor data products, have a, a column that's going to be something like this, something QF usually, um, for the final quality flag. And a final quality flag of zero means that that data passed all of our automated QA, QC tests, and there were no known issues re relating to it. A final quality flag of one would indicate that it, something is suspect about that data and you may not want to use it, or at least you might want to look into what was going on with that data before you do use it. Um, so that might mean that it failed some of the automated QA, QC tests, or it might mean that somebody uh, we uh, found that something had happened in the field that had maybe affected that measurement. You know, maybe in the case of soil temperature, an animal that dug a burrow right next to the sensor or dug, pulled the sensor out of the ground or something like that. So that gives you a feel for what the data is like that we've got in there. Um, I mentioned that we're just going to work with data from one of the soil plots, soil plot one, and also measurement level two. So let's identify the rows in this data table that correspond to that. So first, I'm going to create something called P1 for plot one rows T for temperature. And then we're going to use our grep function, which is like a searching function. And we're going to search for 001, corresponding to soil plot one. And we'll be looking for that in ST dollar sign, the 30 minute data table. So ST underscore 30 underscore minute. And then we want to look for that in the horizontal position column. So if I run that, it's now bringing up this uh, vector over here. We've got uh, over 141,000 rows that correspond to soil plot one in that, in the data that we downloaded. Uh, but we also want to find the rows that correspond to measurement level two. So I'm going to make another vector, D2, so depth two or measurement level two, rows T for temperature again. We're going to use grep again, and this time we're going to look for 502, search for the rows that have 502, indicating measurement level two. And so again, we'll be looking at our soil temperature package in the 30 minute data, and then dollar sign in the, this time we want to look in the vertical position column. So I can run that, and we've got this vector over here with 83, over 83,000 rows in it that all correspond to measurement level two, but that'll be measurement level two in any of the soil plots. Uh, and I'm just going to show in a minute how we're going to filter that down further. But the last thing that we want to do is we we'll, we want to make sure that we're only using the data that passed the QA QC tests. Um, so it doesn't isn't any of this suspect data. So I'm going to read one more vector. Good rows T. These these are the rows that are going to have passed the QA QC test. And then to that we're going to use our which functions. So which parentheses ST the 30 minute data table, and then the final quality flag that we just saw, uh, so final QF, which final QF uh, rows are set to zero. So we're gonna do two equal signs and then a zero and run that. And we've got like 621,000 rows that pass that. That's gonna be for all of the different measurement levels. So we now know the rows that correspond to each of these individual um, criteria, but we want to find the rows that correspond to all of these criteria together. So coming from soil plot one, measurement level two, and that passed the QAQC test. And we're going to do that using the intersect function. So I'm going to take, make one more vector, which I'm going to call use these, T for temperature. And it, we're going to then write intersect. And this is going to find like the common rows in these two, in some of these vectors that we've created. So first, I'm going to paste in the P rows, P1, 
rows T, the rows corresponding to sort plot one, then put a comma, and then I'm gonna paste in D rows, D, sorry, D2 rows T, um, the measurement level two rows. And so if I ran this right now, this would find all the rows that are from soil plot one, measurement level two, but we also wanna filter down to the rows that pass the QAC, QC test, we'll filter out those bad ones. So I'm gonna put the this whole uh, intersect uh, section into parentheses, write another intersect at the beginning of it. And then at the end or between these last two ending parentheses, write a comma, and I'm gonna paste in there the good rows T or the rows that pass that, those QAQC tests. And now I can run that. And now we have this vector, use these T up here, which has got just over 17,000 rows uh, that met all of those criteria. So come from soil plot one, measurement level two, and pass the QAQC test. So that's what we're gonna to want to include in our time series plot. Um, before we make that plot, let's find out the depths that our sensor is installed at. To get, we're gonna use the sensor positions file to do that. And just to get a feel for what that sensor position file looks like, I'm gonna use the head function again. So head parentheses, ST, dollar sign. And then I'm gonna click on the sensor underscore positions underscore 00041, part of the data product ID. And if I run that, it brings up this, the first few lines, the first six lines of this sensor position file. So that some of these column names should look pretty familiar. We've got the site ID in here, SRER, the sensor reader experimental range. Next, we've got this core.ver column. That's the horizontal position and or horizontal index and vertical index. Um, so for example, in the first row, it's 001 corresponding to soil plot one dot 501. So measurement level one in soil plot one. The next row is 001. So again, in soil plot one, but this time 502 indicating that's measurement level two. Uh, we've got some additional information about the, these locations. A start date and time for that uh, position starting back in 2010, and then an end date and time for that position. Now, often these end date and times are set to NA, um, which I think sometimes causes confusion, but all that means is that that sensor is still at that location, it's still at the same place, it's still collecting data. Um, if that something had happened to that sensor and we'd had to reinstall a new sensor in a different location, then there would be an end date and then another row with a different start date and either another end date or perhaps NA and its uh, end date uh, indicating that it's still there. So these ones are all set to NA, um, indicating that those sensors are still operating in the same location. And then if we scroll down a little bit further, now we're starting to get to the area where we've got some information about how the sensor is installed. So the column that we're really gonna be interested in is a Z offset column, and that's the sensor depth relative to the soil surface. We've got some additional columns about how the sensor's been installed. We've got the latitude and longitude and elevation of the reference corner of the soil plot, and then the position of the sensor in the, or its offset in the east direction and then in the north direction relative to that reference corner. So this sensor was, you know, uh, let's see, about two, just under two centimeters west of the reference location and just over two meters north of the reference location. And so that's kind of how those uh, sensor position files are laid out. Let's find the uh, depth of our sensor. So to do that, I'm gonna write ST, our still temperature package we got, uh, the sensor positions file, and then I'm gonna do the brackets, the square brackets, and then we're gonna use the grep function to tell us which rows corresponds to our uh, measurement level and soil plot. So I'm gonna use grep, parentheses. We're going to look for 001 for soil plot one, and then dot 502 for measurement level two. And we're gonna look for that within ST and dollar sign, the sensor positions file, dollar sign, and in that four dot ver column. So if we run that right now, it would print the whole row 
that corresponded to that uh, sensor location. We're just interested in the depth. So I'm going to put a comma and then specify we just want the Z offset, which is the sensor depth. And then if I run that, now down here at the bottom, it's printed out the, uh, the depth of that sensor. So it says zero, negative 0 0.06. The negative sign indicates that the measurement is below the soil surface. And then these are in meters units. So it's 0 0.06 meters below the soil surface or six centimeters below the soil surface. So that's good. So now we know where our sensor, what our sensor depth is and we can use that uh, in our legend when we plot the data. So let's plot that data and take a look at the, what the soil temperature was like. So I'm going to use the plot function, st dollar sign. We first want to specify our date and time stamps. So we're going to use this 30-minute data table. And then we're going to use the start date time column within that data table. But we don't want to plot all of those timestamps that are in there. We only want the ones that corresponded to our sensor and the past the QAQC test. So we're going to put the square brackets and then use these T, the where we filtered down to the rows that uh, related to the sensor that, or the rows that we were interested in, our set, our sensor and the past the QAQC test. Then I'm going to put comma. I'll move to the next line just to keep it clear. And now we're going to add the y-axis. Uh, data points. So ST, dollar sign, the 30 minute data table, dollar sign, and then we want to plot the soil temp mean, mean soil temperature within each of the uh, averaging uh, intervals. Again, we'll put the square brackets and then use these T. And we could run it right now and it would give us a time series plot. I'm just going to make a few other like modifications that'll make it a little bit easier for us to see the data. So for a start, we know we're going to be plotting a year's worth of 30 minute data. So there's going to be a lot of data points. And by default, R uses a relatively large point size. I'm going to change that the size of that point character. So I'm going to write PCH for point character and then put equals and then in quotation marks, I'll just put a period. So it's going to use a period for our data points, something really small. Um, I'm going to set an x-axis label or x-lab equal to just empty quotation marks. It's going to be obvious that this is a time series plot, uh, so we don't really need a label on it. For the y-axis label, y-lab equals, I'll say, soil temperature in degrees C. Uh, and then I know that there is a way, I always forget it, to like write in the ASCII um, command for the degrees sign. I never remember what that is. So instead I do this weird little workaround where I pull up like an email or something and I insert the degree sign into it and then copy it, it over into there. That works pretty fine even if it's not the most efficient way of doing it, probably. So I bet somebody on this call knows a better way of doing it. That's how I do it. Uh, and then we've got degrees C in there. And then the last thing we want to do is add a title to our plot. So we're going to write main, which is the title, and we'll call it S-R-E-R, -E -R, our site code, soil plot one and I'm already 2021. So now we can run that and we should see our time series plot. So yeah, we've got our time series plot popping up over here. Um, pretty expected pattern, you know, warmer soil temperatures in the summer months, cooler temperatures in the winter. Uh, we see pretty extreme differences in the soil temperature um, over the diurnal cycles so from day to night. Uh, which you would expect to see in like a desert site down in Arizona where it's really dry and you get those large temperature swings. The last thing we want to do is add a legend to our plot. So legend, whoops, legend. And then we'll put it in the top left corner. And we want the legend to say six centimeters, the depth of our centimeter of our sensor. I'll put a line, just a solid black line next to it. So LTY for line type equals one. And then I'm going to say 
BTY or box type equals, and then net N for no box around it. And if I run that, then we've added our legend to our time series plot here. So that's what we've done that now for soil temperature. And then we're now gonna do something very similar for soil water content. So I'm just gonna make a new section in the code here, soil water content. And we're gonna make a time series plot for soil water content. Uh, and just like before, there are a lot of sensors uh, with, within the site. We just want to plot one of those sensors. So again, we'll use soil plot one. So we're using the same data from the same soil plot. And we're going to use measurement level one, which has a nominal depth of about six centimeters. So it should, should be close in depth to our soil temperature data. So first, we're going to write P1 rows, but this time M for moisture. And we're going to use the grep function again. We're going to search for 001, soil plot one. And this time we're looking for that in our soil water content or SWC uh, object that we created. But we still want to use the, it's still formatted in a similar way to our soil temperature data. So we're going to use this SWS underscore 30 underscore minute uh, for a time series data. And we're going to look for that in the horizontal position. So you can see it's formatted pretty, pretty similar to the soil temperature data that we have. So that's our plot one rows. Now let's find measurement level one. So write D1 for depth one, rows M, grep. And we're going to look for 501 corresponding to measurement level one for our soil water content sensor, and SWC dollar sign the 30 minute data table, dollar sign. And now we're looking in the vertical positions column. So you can run that. And just like with soil temperature, we only want to use the good data that passed the QAQC test. So right, good rows M, whoops, M. And we'll say which parentheses and then SWC dollar sign our 30 minute data table, dollar sign. Now, soil water content includes two different sub products within it. Uh, it includes the volumetric soil water content. It also includes uh, an ion content, salinity, electrical conductivity. Uh, we're just wanting to use the volumetric soil water content today. So I'm gonna find the final quality flag relate, that relates to that, which is this one, which is VSWC, final QF, volumetric soil water content, final quality flag, and then which ones of those equal zero. So two equal signs and a zero. And that's those rows. And then the last thing we need to do is we found the rows that correspond to each individual, uh, each of these individual criteria. We want the rows that correspond to all of these. So we're going to write use these M. And we'll use that intersect function again intersect parentheses and copy in the P1 rows, M, comma, copy in the D1 rows, M, so soil plot one, measurement level one. Then I'm gonna highlight that whole thing, put it inside parentheses, write another intersect at the beginning of it. And then between the two ending parentheses, put a comma and copy in the good rows, M there. And so that's data that's coming from soil plot one, measurement level one, and that passed the QAQC test. Uh, so now, uh, we'll remember when we looked back at our the soil water content page, it told us that the sensor positions file didn't have the correct sensor depth. And instead, we downloaded this file that I just pulled up here. And now on this one, I'll make it a little bigger for you. Um, this has got data or the depths for all of the NEON sites, but I'm going to filter down to the sites and the soil plot and the measurement level that we're interested in. So I'm going to, just, and I'm just going to do this in Excel for simplicity, but you could do it in R if you wanted to. We're going to find the SRER site, and I'll just click that one. We're just interested in soil plot one, so I'm going to deselect all of those and just check soil plot one. And then in the vertical position, dot fur, we're just interested in measurement level one. So I'm just going to click the 501 line. And then in our sensor depths column here, 
you've got a sensor depth of actually the same as our temperature sensor, negative 0.06, so indicating that it was six centimeters below the soil surface. And we see that it's still in that original position. So now we know that this sensor was also measuring at six centimeters deep, and we can use that in our um, plot legend. But one thing I want to do, well, with our soil water content data, it's in units of meters cubed per meters cubed, and the, the cubed parts of those units are, of course, uh, superscript, but the plot function doesn't let, let us specify the superscript, so we're going to create that uh, axis label ahead of time and then bring that into the plot function so that it can display those superscripts. So I'm going to make this y-axis label now, take something called label M for a soil moisture label. We're going to use the expression function, so expression, parentheses, and then we're going to paste together various components. So I paste, parentheses, and then we start off, we want our label to say soil water content. It's going to be in units of meters, whoops, meters cubed. Uh, so I can write the M for the meters, but then I want that cubed to be superscript. So I'm going to move outside of that, the quotation marks, put an up caret to indicate superscript, and then new quotation marks, and I put space three. So that's saying that that three is going to be uh, displayed superscript. Then I move outside of those quotation marks, put a comma to end the superscript. New quotation marks, space M for our next meters cubed. So this is going to be the per meters cubed part. And then move outside of those quotation marks, put the up caret for the next superscript, which we're going to put new quotation marks and then negative three. So that negative three is going to be in superscript. And then moving outside of the quotations, put a comma to end the superscript. And then we just need to put the final closing parentheses on there. And now I can run that, and that's created our label uh, that we'll be able to use in uh, the plot. So let's make that plot right now. So we're going to use the plot function, parentheses. We're going to start off with our uh, timestamp. So SWC, we're using the 30 minute data dollar sign and our start date time column. But just like before, we don't use all of the time points. We just want the time points that relate to our measurement level that passed the QAQC test. So we're going to put in the square brackets and use these M. Then our y-axis, we want to add SWC, the 30-minute data, dollar sign, and we want to add in the volumetric soil water content. So that's this one here, VSWC mean square brackets, and then use these M. And just like before, we're going to slightly modify the way that the plot displays so it's easier to see all the data that we're going to be plotting. So we're going to change the point character, PCH, to equal quotation marks and um, period. So it's going to use a period for plotting it. We're going to have our X axis label or X lab, just set to empty quotation marks. We won't uh, put anything there. And then our Y axis label, Y lab, is going to be set to label M, that label that we just created. And if we run that, now we get our time series plot of soil moisture, which you can see sort of typical patterns for soil moisture, spikes up in soil moisture, presumably relating to rain events, and then uh, gradual declines, at least until the next rain event occurring. Um, and so pretty typical patterns. The one thing that hasn't quite worked right is well, we've got our label displaying right, but it's being chopped off a little bit. The margins on the plot isn't quite big enough. So let's modify those margins so that we can see our, um, our axis label properly. So in the line above the plot, I'm going to write par for the graphical per parameter. Then I'm going to write mar equals so mar for margins, and then C parentheses. And we're going to specify what uh, size margin we want for all sides of the plot. Um, and it starts off with the bottom, and then it moves to the uh, left hand side, then the top, and then the right hand side. So I'm going to put three for the bottom, something a bit bigger for the left side where we need some more space, five, and then two for the top, and then one for the right hand side. And now if I run that and then the plot line again, now we see we create a bit more space, everything's shifted over a little bit, and we can see our label correctly. 
And the last thing we need to do is add our legend. Uh, again, we can put it in the top left corner. And we've got space. We want the legend to say six centimeters. We just want the solid black line next to it. So LTY for line type equals one. And then BTY for box type equals N for none. And I can run that. And now we've added our legend to the soil, plot, uh, to the, um, soil moisture time series plot that we've created. So that's good. We now got our time series for soil temperature and soil moisture. Now let's make one for soil CO2. Uh, and again, we're going to do it in a pretty similar way. The one thing that's going to be different for soil CO2 is we're going to plot all three measurement levels since there's not too many of them. But we'll start off identifying again the rows that correspond to soil plot one. So we're getting the data from the soil, the same soil plot as our temperature and moisture data. It's going to make this vector P1 rows C for CO2 this time. So we're using our grep function again. And we're going to be searching for 001 for soil plot one. We're looking now, we're going to be using our CO2 list that we created where we put our CO2 data, dollar sign. Again, we've got a similar set of files showing up. Uh, and we're just, we're going to be using the uh, 30 minute data, so SCO2C, for soil CO2 concentration, and then underscore 30 underscore minute, 30 minute data. And then we're going to be looking for that in the horizontal position to find all the rows for soil plot one. I can run that. Next, let's find the rows that correspond to, to measurement level one, so D1 rows C. And we're going to do grep again. We're going to look for 501 for measurement level one. And then we're going to look in CO2, dollar sign, the 30 minute data table, dollar sign. And we're going to look in the vertical position column. Now I can run that. And then I'm just going to copy that last line and paste it two more times because we can just slightly modify it to find measurement level two and three. So for the second line where I've copied it, I'm going to change it from D1 row C to D2 row C. And then I'm just going to change what we were searching for from 501 to 502. And then in the third row where we copied it, I'm going to change it to D3 row C. And we're going to be looking for 503. And now I can run those two lines. And that's going to be the rows that correspond to each measurement level. We also want to find the rows that pass our QAQC test. So we'll write good rows. C. We'll use the which function. So which parentheses CO2 dollar sign, the 30 minute data table. And we're going to look for our our final quality format, so I'm scrolling down a little bit here, final QF equals, so two equals signs, and then a zero, and I can run that. And then we want to find the rows that correspond to all three of these criteria for each measurement level. So I'm going to write use these C1, so these are going to be the rows that we use for measurement level one for the CO2 data intercept, just like before parentheses and copy in P1 rows C, comma. I'll copy in first, I'll do the measurement level one. So I'll copy in D1 rows C. So that's going to be the rows from soil plot one measurement level one. I'm going to put that inside parentheses, write another intersect at the start of it. And then between the last two ending parentheses, put a comma, copy in the good rows C one step past the QAQC test. And now I can run that. And we've got this up, this uh, vector up here, use the C1, uh, that's got almost 17,000 rows uh, corresponding to measurement level one in soil plot one past the QAQC test. Now I'm just going to copy that line two more times. And we're just going to modify it slightly for measurement level two and three. So in the second line where I've copied it, I'm going to change it to use these C2. And I'm going to change it instead of being D1 row C, it's going to be D2 row C. And then in the third line, I'm going to change it from use the C1 to use the C3. And now we'll change it to D3 row C. 
I can run those lines. And now we've got our, you know, the data that we want to use in our time series plot. We just need to find out the depths of our sensors. So I'm going to make a vector called rows. And we're going to search. We're going to use the grep function again to look for all the rows in the sensor positions file that have 0, 0, 001, this little plot one. We're going to be looking in CO2, dollar sign, this time in the sensor positions file. So sensor underscore positions underscore 0, 0, 0, 0095. And uh, looking in the or dot ver column, the second column here. And we can run that. And we expect there to be at least three rows that correspond to that, because we know that there are three measurement levels in each little plot. And so if I look up here at the rows vector that's appeared up here, we can see it does include three different uh, values, rows one, two, and three correspond to soil plot one. Um, and so those are the rows of the sensor position file that we're interested in. Now let's find the measurement depths for those rows. So we're going to write CO2, dollar sign, the sensor positions file, and then the square brackets. I'm going to say that we want to print the rows that we called rows. So rows, and then comma. And then we're just interested in the sensor depths. So I'm just going to write Z offset. So that's the column that we want. Print. So we're printing these rows that we identified, and then we're just printing the Z offset column. And if I run that, we get three values appearing down here. So these sensors were measuring the shallow one was at two centimeters, then the next one was at five centimeters, and the next one was at 19 centimeters below the soil surface. So we've got those sensor depths now. With, similar to soil moisture, um, our soil CO2 concentration y-axis label is going to have uh, subscripts in. So that's the two of the CO2 is going to be a subscript. So we want to make that uh, label ahead of time. So let's do that. And then we're going to make our time series plot. So we're going to make something called label C. We'll put, use the expression function again. So expression, parentheses. We're going to paste together the different components. So paste parentheses, and we want our label to start off saying soil, CO, and then I'm going to move outside of those quotation marks, put in square brackets to indicate a subscript, and just put a two inside those square brackets, then a comma outside of them to indicate the end of the subscript, new quotation marks, and then space, concentration, oops, concentration, and then in parts per million units, so PPM units. Now we can run that, and now we've got our y-axis label, and we can make our plot. So I'm going to write plot, parentheses, we want to plot our CO2 data. We're going to be using the 30-minute data file. We want to have our timestamp on the x-axis, so start, date, time, square brackets, and we'll write use these C1. So first we're going to be plotting the data for measurement level one. We want to, on the y-axis to be plotting the CO2 data, the 30-minute data, dollar sign, and then soil CO2 concentration mean, square brackets, and again use these C1. And then just like before, we're going to slightly modify how our graph displays. So we'll change the point character PCH to equal period, again, a really small data points. Uh, X axis label or X lab will equal empty quotation marks, no X axis label. Y axis label, Y lab equal to our label that we just made, which we called label C. And then uh, the last thing that we want to do is specify our Y axis uh, limits of it. Um, so I happen to know from playing around with this data a little bit already that if we have a y-axis going from zero to 10,000, that that'll be sufficient to plot all of the, the, the data that we're going to be working with. Of course, if this is your first time, 
use, you know, looking at that data, you're not going to know that. But it doesn't usually take too long to play around with it a little bit to see uh, what's the right data range. Um, so I'm going to write y lim, so the limits of the y axis, equals c, and then parentheses zero, so starting at zero and going up to 10,000. So now I can run that, and we have our time series plot of soil CO2 concentration, at least for measurement level one at this at this site. Uh, you can see, you know, concentration is pretty close to atmospheric for long chunks of the year, um, but then in late summer we get these increases in CO2 concentration before it drops back down again. So that's measurement level one. Now let's add in the other measurement levels uh, because we're adding the, the points to this same plot. We don't want to create a new plot. We're going to use the points function. So I'm going to write points, and then I'm just going to well, I've put um, parentheses, and then I'm just going to copy the first three lines that we put in our plot function. So our timestamp, our soil CO2 concentration mean, and then the PCH uh, specifying that we're using a, a period for our data points. And I got to paste that into the points section. And then there's just a couple of things we need to change. So instead of plotting the use the C1 data, we want to plot use the C2 measurement level two. I changed that for the timestamp and also for the soil CO2 concentration mean uh, to use the C2. Uh, we'll still use the same PCH character. And then the last thing you want to do is put it, plot it as a different color. So write call equals, and we'll do red. And if I run that, now we've read in our red data points, our measurement level two. You can see a pretty similar pattern really to measurement level one except that the CO2 concentrations tend to be a little bit higher uh, once they start increasing. Now let's add measurement level three. So I'm just going to copy this whole points section. And all we need to do is change it from use the C2 to use the C3 for both the timestamp and the soil CO2 concentration mean. And I'm going to change the color from red to blue so we can distinguish it. I'll plot that. And again, we've added that on. And, and we see that the pattern is pretty similar, but the concentrations are even higher, which is quite typical for soil CO2 concentration profiles. They tend to be higher, deeper down in the soil and lower near the surface, where it's easier for the CO2 molecules to diffuse into the atmosphere. So they don't build up quite so high concentrations near the surface. The last thing we'll do is add a legend. So legend. Again, we can just put it in the top left where we've got a lot of space in our graph. Uh, we want our legend to say, so legend equals, uh, and then this time we've got three components to our legend. So we put C, parentheses, and then in quotation marks, and we put two centimeters, then comma, new quotation marks, uh, five centimeters, and then 19 centimeters, the three measurement depths that we found for our sensors. We want a solid line plotted next to them, so line type or LTY equals one for solid line, but we want the color of those lines to vary, so col color equals C and then parentheses, and we want the first line to be black, the second line to be red, and the third line to be blue uh, to match our data points. And then lastly, I'm going to say BTY equals N in quotation marks to say no box about it around our legend. So then we've got a legend here with these color coded lines next to it relating to the data points. Um, so, you know, we've made our, our three time series now, and probably you can remember a little bit. Uh, what the soil temperature and soil moisture look like, and you might have some ideas for what's influencing soil CO2 concentrations at this site. But to make it easier to see that, it can be useful to plot all three of these graphs um, together on a single plot. And so let's, the very last thing we're going to do before we open it up for questions is create a multi-panel plot. And so let me write one new section here, we'll call it multi-panel plot. And the only thing that we really need to modify is we just need to tell R that we want to have three gra graphs all displayed on a single plot. And so to do, to do that, we use the MF call uh, parameter. So I'm going to type par for the graphical parameter, 
parentheses, MF call equals, and then C parentheses, three, one. And so that's telling R that we want in our plot to have three rows and just one column. So there's going to be all three graphs that are going to be plotted on top of each other. Um, we'll start off with our soil temperature graph, then soil moisture, and then soil CO2 concentration. And then we don't really need to write any new code. We can just copy what we've already done, but I'm going to write a section called soil temp. I'm going to scroll all the way up to the top to our soil temperature graph that we made earlier on. And I'm just going to copy the plot and the legend lines, that section, copy that, scroll all the way down to the bottom, and I'll paste it in underneath. I'll make another section just so you can keep track of what went where, called SWC for soil water content. Scroll up to the soil water content graph, and I'm going to copy plot and legend lines, copy and paste that down here. And then lastly, soil CO2. And copy all the way from plot through our two points where we added the different measurement levels and then getting the legend as well and paste that down there. And then if I go back up to that MF call, so par MF call line, if I run that, we can start assembling this multi-panel plot. And so if I run the first plot, I've added the soil temperature time series and it added its legend, then the soil water content time series and its legend, and then the soil CO2 time series for measurement level one, and then adding in measurement level two and three, and the legend for that. And then, you know, I don't think I'll, I'll spend too much time trying to interpret this. I guess to me looking at it, it looks like maybe both soil temperature and soil moisture are factors that influence soil CO2 concentrations at this particular site. So we only see these higher concentrations when the soils are both uh, moist and also uh, when they're warmer uh, and not at other times of the year. Um, I will just finish up saying that uh, many people or many users are more interested in soil respiration rates than soil CO2 concentrations themselves. And you can calculate soil respiration rates using this NEON data along with some other NEON data products, but you need to calculate the soil CO2 diffusivity coefficient, so how quickly the CO2 can diffuse through the soil in order to convert these concentration gradients into a respiration rates. Um, some users have already done that, and in the data tutorial right at the bottom, I put some links to where you can see examples of that, and even one of the links, it links to a GitHub repository where you can uh, see the code that uh, a researcher implemented to do just that, uh, if, you're, if that's something that you're interested in. And then with that, I will finish up, and it looks like we've still got about 25 minutes for questions.